I'm gonna... Hello? Hello. Okay, start my video. Hi, everybody. Thank you. And Hello. welcome to welcome to immigration coffee talk. So I'm sorry about the early morning, but it is coffee talk and it is early in New York for New Yorkers. But thank you for zooming in on this. And I hope you all are enjoying your coffee. Um, I just, you know, I want I want you to know that we do these coffee talks in immigration, especially with the point of view typically of US immigration every eight to 10 weeks, Marcel and I, because it's just so fluid what's been happening in the United States with immigration. So about every eight to 10 weeks, we have coffee talk where we discuss the latest that is happening. Our next <clears throat> coffee talk will be after the elections in November. So we will probably have one where the topic will be this, the trends and what we predict uh, will happen depending on the election results. Um, this time, our coffee talk is part of a, our a larger summit with the firm in, on change, innovation, and opportunity. So there is other, uh, par other parts of Green Spoon Martyr you can join because we just happen to be part of the innovation summit this time. And we'd like to think we're pretty uh, innovative. So um, with that said, we were fortunate enough to have these amazing partners from other law firms who are experts in their field, who we've had an opportunity to either work with them and or their firm on many topics that affect uh, US citizens, immigration, employment in France and the UK. Um, of course, we are here for those who know Marcella Bermudez, also um, an awarded and renowned immigration practice, practitioner from the US. We're gonna start from a US perspective, and then we're gonna move over to Stefan in France, and then we will move over to the UK and discuss pre Brexit and those issues facing people there. And so I invite Marcella to start with the wonderful topic of travel bans that currently exist for a lot of our multinational, foreign national who travel or are in um, one of our travel ban countries. Okay, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, what we wanted to do is just start with um, kind of the status of where we are. There haven't been that many changes, um, at least from the, the date the ban started. Um, but we wanted to go through what the bans are for those of you who are probably haven't followed us on our coffee talks, just so that we're kind of all updated. Um, so the bans with the countries, the country bans are probably um, the most prominent ones. Um, we still have a ban and it's, it's supposed to run through the end of the year. Uh, once we see what happens with the election, we'll, we may have more of an indication of what's to come for 2021, but our bans are still in existence with China, Iran, EU Schengen countries, um, as well as UK, Ireland, and Brazil. Uh, Brazil was the last one to be added. And then also we have other restrictions in terms of border restrictions with Canada and, and Mexico. So those are still um, in place. Um, one clarification that is important for people to know, even though it's called the ban, there are uh, what we call workarounds, essentially. The ban is a 14-day period. So if you've been in those countries for 14 days before you attempt entry to the U.S., that's when that ban is triggered. Um, so what, are, you, what are those countries again? China, Iran, all Schengen countries, UK, Ireland, Brazil, Canada, Mexico with the border crossing. Um, and so the 14 days, so you want to be mindful. If the travel is coming from the 14 days prior, that's when that ban is triggered. However, if you are in those countries, you go to another country, you, a layover, a 14-day layover, much longer than anyone has ever done. But if you have a layover in another country, that changes your scenario. So it's not a nationality ban, it's a where have you been in the last 14 days ban. Okay, so that's really important. Oh, so I couldn't quarantine in the U.S. voluntarily. Upon entry? 
No, 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 there's, it's a ban. It's not, um, it, it's an entry ban. So the authority that Trump has um, that with all these proclamations, he can restrict, he's not restricting or changing immigration laws per se in terms of we're not issuing, um, uh, the, the categories can't be applied for here. It's a restriction on how a person is able to enter the U.S. Um, so that's the extent of the restriction and we're in it until at least end of December. Now there are exceptions which, which we're going to get to. Um, the other ban, um, so those are the, the country COVID-based bans, and then you also have the ones that are based on the economy to protect the U.S. economy and the workforce. Uh, so you have an immigrant visa ban, so if you have an immigrant visa um, for family-based, it affects really largely family-based uh, classifications and people who are, are chose to go through the business route by getting a green card abroad. That entry to the U.S. is also restricted. Um, exceptions are if you're, and this is pretty much for all the bans, um, with the, the one I will talk about that has to do with the labor market. If you're an LPR, spouses, children of U.S. citizens, if you're a health care worker, if you have a government um, law enforcement objectives, anything that has to do with what we call the national interest to the U.S., there are exceptions that you can apply for. Um, now, the, in the business world, the biggest restriction that we're facing is the one with uh, restricting issuance of H-1B visas, L visas, J's, most J's, not all of them. So when you talk about the, uh, the bans, um, you're, the work bans, you're talking about visa, visa classification. Yes, visa issuance at the consulate. So the ban is, you can apply if you're here, perfect. You can apply for your change of status. Um, if you have to go outside to get your visa, this is when, when this gets triggered. Now, after that rule was passed, and a lot of what's happened with the Trump administration, we get a rule, day one, two or three days later, clarification, this is what we meant. Uh, another week later, another clarification. So that's kind of the way we've been going, <laughs> this administration. Um, and one of the, uh, fortunately, the way the, the law was written is actually the way it's supposed to be interpreted. So if you are physically in the United States on June 24th, the date that the ban for H or L visa issuance, if you are present, that ban is not supposed to affect you. So this is, this is where, so, so we kind of know where the landmark is. Now the issue comes in, in the following, is how do we get the consulates to implement and dialogue with us to execute the way these laws are supposed to be implemented. And that's where we are, we are coming up against a little bit of, uh, of a struggle here. Um, the consulates have implemented what we call national interest exemptions, and we've worked with various of our clients in obtaining them. When they first came out, they were pretty seamless. They were pretty straightforward. What 24 hour, 48 hour requests responded to, and now we're starting to hit a backlog again. Um, so it's a backlog that's created. Now we're, we're, we're in September, October. And the bans are supposed to be lifted in, in, in December, so you're in the end of December, so you start to wonder, are they looking to just drag their feet until we get to the end? We don't know. We're, we're trying to dialogue with the best we can as consistently as we can with them. Um, but, but that's where the hurdle is, is everything's in place, now we have to get it executed. Um, so our national interest exemptions, you're supposed to write to the consulate, ask them, um, I'm eligible for these exemptions. I can come into the U.S. even though I'm supposedly not eligible for H-1B, but I, wasn't, I was here in the U.S., I had a valid visa, extend my visa, and they're supposed to grant you. So they'll schedule you, but then they can cancel you. So there's a lot of ebbs and flows in this whole process, and it's really a bumpy road for all of us. So patience is key on this, on this process. Um, <laughs> But that's, where, that's kind of where your, your national interest exemptions are. Um, again, that, that it's a big um, thing to know. If you were here on that date, that ban is not supposed to affect you. If you're getting a visa, an H-1B in the same category, same employer, that's not supposed to affect you. Now, that is what we know. We, that's, that's the provision. That's the regulation. The other part of it is implementing it. It's not supposed to affect you in terms of obtaining a visa. If the U.S. Correct. is open in those countries. Yes, and so that's the other part. So the consulates in July started phasing in the, the openings of their, of their operations. Now they're really slowly and they're phased in. And they're, it's kind of like an on and off switch. They're on, they're open, and then all of a sudden, if there's a surge, canceled your appointment, reschedule. So it really puts a burden on travelers, uh, on, on our expats and our foreign nationals, making decisions to travel and now they seem to be falling back into these. You have your appointment. Uh, no, you don't reschedule. So it's, it's, it's a lot of planning. And if at this point, 
we're in, in September or October. If you can withhold traveling, maybe that's probably better. Uh, unless your, your travel kind of bridges with the following year, with 2021. And even then, we're waiting to see. Let's see what happens in November elections to kind of get an indication of where we might be headed. And just to ask some of the questions that I'm receiving, um, let's say I had a valid visa to enter the United States, how, and I was coming from, and I am an Indian national. Do would you see an issue? If you have the visa, where are you coming from? So you're an Indian national, I need to know the country you're traveling from. So now you're on the COVID-19 country restrictions. If you are coming um, from India and there's no ban, that's fine, and there isn't. Uh, if you're coming from another country, not Schengen country, not the UK, not Ireland, you're, you're in good position. Come in, obviously, with a current letter. If you've been out for a long time, I think what's very good practice is come in with a letter to show that you're coming to resume business or assume the position that you were approved for so that they don't think that in, during that lag, you lost your employment or something. And um, so if you traveled, let's say, you are an Indian citizen, but you traveled, let's say, to Paris then of course you're subject to the travel ban. Triggers, the ban triggers, correct. So this kind of segues us to Stefan in France. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I saw that coming. I really would appreciate that segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, uh, actually, everything that Marcella uh, just said um, is, is, is exactly the experience we've had here in France. Um, uh, but perhaps before I give a little bit more details about France um, um, and considering I'm the only UK citizen here invited in the panel, uh, uh, I may or you may want to hear a few words about Europe, the EU. Um, uh, for, for, for some of us, for some people, um, uh, Europe um, being a single territory with a... Um, 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 a, a single um, legal system was a vision. Uh, uh, it probably still is, uh, but what it is, uh, um, um, it is a fiction. Um, it is not true. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, European member states have adopted a number of measures to protect public health, some of which have had a, a significant impact on freedom of movement, such as the introduction of internal borders or travel restrictions with the EU. And these national initiatives were individual ones without any coordination. Um, uh, as an illustration, uh, I would like to show um, the people who are uh, attending the session a, a map of the national measures that were taken in the EU back in April. Um, as you can see, um, uh, uh, um, depending on the country uh, uh, that you consider going to, national measures were very diverse, very different. So um, considering the EU as one single country, uh, one single territory with, with one um, um, single legal system is, is, is wrong. Um, uh, I don't know how I get back here, yes. Uh, so with the aim Very of Very lucky of you, by the way, Stefan, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I've been trying hard to do that. I see that. <laughs> uh, so with the aim of avoiding uh, the fragmentation and the disruption of services and to ensure transparency and predictability for citizens and businesses, the EU Council has been working on adopting a coordinated approach. As a result, we may mention two pieces of something I cannot call a legislation because it is not binding. In July, there was a recommendation on the temporary restriction on um, non-essential travel to the EU and the possible lifting of such restriction. So the EU uh, recommended to draw a list of so-called green countries for which travel restrictions should be lifted. And for other countries, a list of categories of people that should be exempted from any restrictions, mainly listed as follows, EU citizens and their family members, long-term EU residents and their family members, and travelers, quote, with an essential function or need, uh, end, end of quote. Uh, in September, the EU Commission presented a proposal 
um, uh, for a recommendation to ensure that any measures taken by EU member states to restrict the free movement of people due to the um, pandemic are uh, hence, henceforth coordinated and clearly communicated at the EU level. Um, that proposal includes um, a common mapping system based on a color code, green, orange, red, gray, and the determination of common criteria for member states when deciding whether to introduce travel restrictions, a common approach for travelers from so-called red areas, as well as a more readable and timely information to the public. Um, but because those um, uh, communications from, from the EU institutions are not binding, they've been implemented in, 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 in very different ways or in, in, in a subtle different ways um, by, by member states. For instance, um, when you go to the definition of essential travel of, in the context of skilled workers and essential business travel, as far as France is concerned, it's, got, it's only gonna be holders of a highly skilled work permits who may enter France coming from countries other than green ones. But if you go to Belgium, uh, 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 it will be considered um, possible only if the work is economically necessary and cannot be postponed. Um, uh, in Germany, uh, skilled and highly qualified employees whose activities are economically necessary and can be postponed or performed from, from abroad. So every, every time you- The question is, are like Europeans walking around with a color-coded map wondering where they can and cannot go? And, 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 and that color map is, you know, can change overnight. So- uh, So they're uh, sitting there with their pads going, okay, I'm, I, I can't go see you in Germany. It's not the right color today. It's, it's actually, it's actually a, um, a test or a control that you want to make before boarding when you're at the airport at the last minute, just to be sure, because uh, you, don't know, you don't know how it's gonna be when you reach um, your point of destination. We, we, um, I think it was in July, we had, we had people flying out from France to Norway. They arrived two minutes after midnight uh, and they had to go into quarantine for two weeks. If they had landed uh, one minute before midnight, no quarantine was, 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 was compulsory. So this is the kind of information you, you, you need to get on a, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis. But Stefan, like in the US and Marcella, you know, can speak to this, like even though we talk about the travel bans, if you, you know, we do have exceptions, for example, if you're a US citizen, they're not gonna say, sorry, can't come in, or a green card holder, or if you're coming here to see your, your US children or something like that. How, is that true with the European countries? Is that if I have, if I'm French and my family lives in, let's say the UK, I mean, not the UK, I mean, <laughs> Germany, can I go visit? Can I go visit them? Well, um, Did I, do I have to look or is there an exception among family members? Because with the, the vision of the EU, it was as one. So you never had to think about that before. Yes, as Marcella mentioned, um, it, it, it really, it really uh, I mean, what, what triggers restrictions or not is, is the country of origin. So depending on where you're coming from, uh, you can freely enter any EU country or, uh, um, uh, and without any, any kind of formality, without uh, a PCR test, without an international travel certificate, without having to go through quarantine. Uh, uh, so there is, there is a list of, of those green countries of origin where no restriction um, we, will apply. Um, but if you, if you come from um, a non-green country, then uh, you will have to fall within one, one of the boxes, one of the loopholes provided by the legislation. That is, uh, uh, you need to have um, uh, an international travel, travel certificate explaining uh, the reason why you're coming over, and that reason is going to be listed in in a, in a, in, a, in an official uh, list provided by by the by the government. Uh, but when, when when it comes to um, um, family reunion, for instance, um, it is interesting to see that um, I don't know if it's got anything to do with with the with the culture of, of France, but um, um, now we have a specific exemption for 
for uh, uh, travel uh, and that is necessary for sentimental relationship. So, um, uh, see, so it, it's moving the good direction. So if you can evidence that you- I like you, that, I like the sense of togetherness. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you still need to evidence that the, the, you know, the relationship has been you know, going on for at least six months. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say like kind of serious, but you, you, you need to show that uh, uh, that um, it is not something just in your mind, and you're the only one involved in that alleged, uh, you know, sentimental relationship. It's been existing, so so now now it's it's possible. Uh, but again, depending on the countries, for instance, in, in Greece, um, they are more flexible when it comes to family reasons for for travel. But it's got to do with with the culture with the culture as well. So um, just one final question before we move to the UK, if a US citizen was traveling into France today and they were able to come in for essential reasons. Um, would they be able to, would they have to prove essential if they go to Portugal, if they go to Germany, if they go to the other countries within the EU? No, 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 no. Um, they, they will be able to enter France and then, and then travel within the um, um, Schengen area. But, but traveling from the U.S., there is that one formality that applies to U.S. Uh, uh, um, to U.S. travelers uh, uh, is a is a health test, a PCR. They won't be able to board the plane and land in Paris if they cannot show a PCR negative test before boarding. Yeah, we're on the list. <laughs> we <Yeah>. got that. <laughs> and even for what about if you're a, a foreign national? You're not a French citizen, but you're not an American citizen, but you were in the U.S. Do you have that type of quarantining restriction? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the control will be made at, at the port of departure in the airport. Um, that is good stuff. And that is, um, you know, you got to keep your country safe, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in the U.K., if we were to travel there, it's a little different, right, Maria? Um, Yes, indeed. I think what we're quickly learning is that it's different everywhere <laughs> and everywhere has uh, uh, different rules, however arbitrary they may be. Um, and just one point before I answer your question, I think um, Stefan was saying he may be the only European on the call, but I beg to differ. I know. I <laughs> yeah, exactly. I span all of you. I have both. Uh, also, I have a British passport, an American passport, and a Cypriot passport. So I've got all bases covered. Um, anyway, so um, yes, it, it, for U.S. citizens traveling to the U.K., um, it, they fall into a category of high risk, um, along with many, many other countries. Um, and uh, the solution from the U.K. point of view is to force people to self-quarantine. And when I say force, obviously it's a self-quarantine. So they're trusting that people come to the U.K. from this long list of countries and they self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, if they do not meet the, the, the self-quarantine, quarantine rules, there are spot checks um, where the police will either call or visit and check whether that person is indeed quarantining. If they are not, there is a, a band of fines and a criminal, it's a criminal offence. Um, and the, the, the fine level uh, ranges from 1,000 at the lowest to 10,000 at the highest. So they're really cracking down on it and trying to seem tough on it. However, the reality is um, they do not have the resources to check up on everyone who is meant to be self-quarantining. So it really is, um, you know, relying on people's own um, um, decision to do the right thing. Um, so, so that's, you know, I think some people are taking it seriously and some not so much, which is why we're seeing a second wave or spike. Um, as I know, uh, New York is going through something similar at the moment. As soon as the borders opened, then all of a sudden everyone sees a spike, even in countries where um, they're taking extra precautions, such as uh, Cyprus and Greece that Stefan mentioned. Um, in Cyprus, everyone has to have a, a negative COVID test, um, either in advance of travel within 72 hours or on arrival. They have to pay 60 euros when they land and they have to have one there. In Greece, half of the plane is tested ad hoc um, and uh, they do it like that um, for free. So it's, it's different countries are doing it differently, um, but I think globally, we are seeing a spike sadly what well how do you think brexit is going to affect 
all these economic uh, issues aside from, you know, the COVID itself, obviously? Well, it's a good question. And I think the, the simple answer is it's going to affect it very badly. Um, we already had a negative situation with Brexit. You layer COVID on top um, and we've got a very bad outlook here, uh, both economically, financially um, and, and, and the rest, emotionally, uh, mentally, um, uh, medically. All, all of it is not looking good because at the moment we don't have a deal um, for, for um, when we're due to Brexit, which is the 1st of January. January. Um, it's fast approaching. Um, there's a lot of toing and froing. Stefan probably can give the European side of this. Um, there's a lot of political posturing, um, and and um, it's it's difficult. Of course, everyone wants to be seen to be getting what's what's a good deal for them. Um, from the European side, it's a lot harder because um, you've got to satisfy all of the European states. It's not just one country negotiating. So you're, it's a balancing act. Um, so yes, from an immigration point of view. It's, it's tricky, um, but the government have introduced a, a system called the settlement scheme. So all European nationals who currently live in the UK or are planning on moving to the UK before we Brexit, the deadline to move to the UK is 31st of December of this year. So there's still time. Um, everyone has to register under this settlement scheme. If they've been in the UK for less than five years, then they have to register as pre-settled. And if they've been in the UK for five years or more, they can register as settled. Um, so, so that's the plan going forward um, in relation to post January uh, when when we Brexit the new rules have been um, uh, laid out but they haven't been approved yet so we, we don't know for sure what's going to happen but we assume um, that there's going to be this new points based system going forward that's going to be applicable to all European nationals from the 1st of January. If I if I may say something about the, the Brexit um, um, like Maria mentioned, the Brexit and the COVID, uh, but they, 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 there's been a lot of fuss in, in, in the news for the past you know, few days about a bill called the, the like a, a British bill called the Internal Market Bill. Um, um, I, I, I don't know if you've, you probably have heard of it, Maria. Uh, it's been very controversial um, because you know I, I, can't, I can't go too much in detail about it you know because what, what we hear about it you know, from from continental Europe is only uh, uh, the consequences it may have as far as um, the EU and the Brexit are concerned. Um, but that 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 bill uh, contains a part that says that any part of the Brexit deal which contradicted quote cease to be recognized in domestic law unquote. And, and prominent, uh, prominent um, um, uh, legal prof law professionals in the UK, as well as in continent continental Europe, have seen this bill as a, a provocative um, um, uh, 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 express and, 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 and involuntary breach of the international law, uh, because that bill ends up with authorizing uh, local governments in the, in the UK uh, to take any measure or to take measures that go against an international treaty um, um, that is the withdrawal agreement. And, and up here, uh, um, uh, two or three quotes from um, uh, EU, um, in EU representatives. Uh, uh, the head of the EU Council uh, tweeted, um, I'm very concerned about announcements from the British government on its intentions to breach, to breach the withdrawal agreement. This would break international law and, and undermines trust. Um, the president of the EU Council added, breaking international law is not acceptable and does not create the confidence we need to build our future relationship. And the EU Parliament's president said, if the UK government fails to honor the commitment that it signed up to last year, then trust and credibility will be lost. And those comments are important because when it comes to the future of the relationship between the UK and, and the EU, it is still to be negotiated. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I don't know to what extent that that bill was, was a political move, provocative political move, maybe to distract uh, uh, the British voters' attention, you know, from, from something else and, 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 and focus it on, on, on this. Uh, uh, but, but obviously, at, at least as of today, uh, uh, it creates a critical um, uh, environment for future negotiations to take place. 
And if we don't end up with something specific in terms of relationship with the UK, then the UK will be considered as third country nationals, like at any other South country nationals and EU citizens will be considered the same when going to the UK. Yeah, I mean, thank, thank you, Stefan. I, I, just, just to jump in here before um, I pass on to you, Patricia. Um, I, I completely agree with you. It, it was a, a very surprising and bold move. Um, but, but going back to the beginning of my introduction, which was about political posturing, and I believe that's what this is. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the game. Um, they're, they're all kind of, um, we're at the last bit of, of, of the negotiations. Really, it's getting serious now. And, and I do think that you're right. Boris was trying to avert uh, public eyes back onto Brexit. Um, um, and um, yes, I, I don't think that there is a real intention to break international treaties. I think it's there as a backstop measure just in case it all goes wrong to protect the, um, the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland. But, um, you know, as I said, it's, it's, it's all part of the politics, the fun and games. Um, so I, I, I know this is a bit unusual, but I have a question for Marcella, since we're doing a conversation, um, very <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, from, from a UK perspective, you were mentioning you know, let, don't do anything until November um, if you can, if you can avoid traveling till then. Um, just for those that, that maybe don't know how things work in, in US politics in the same way. I mean, how instant is it if, if Biden is um, elected? I mean, will, will the laws change straight away? Presumably not. You've got no. to no, so it's so the travel. The, well, the recommendation is let's see what happens in November, but travel obviously these are in place till the end of December. Right. Um, but because this is this is where my concerns are in practicality. Let's say people have plans for travel in end of October, November, December. Now you're dealing with getting permissions and exceptions from a consulate. They're on holiday, long weekends, uh, maybe spikes in COVID. So there's so much unpredictability that in their minds, just being human thinking, well. What, what, what matters? A few more weeks, just stay put, January's rolling around. Um, so as a practical application, I feel that that's a possible risk. November, December, they're really shot um, and dead days, many of them during the, during the holidays. So Stefan and Maria, we have mm -hmm. people who are European, um, who are participants on, on, on this call. And let's say they are, I mean, Let's say they're a citizen of Germany. Let's just say Germany. Um, that's neutral. <laughs> I'm not going to say you can or France. I can tell you that right now. But let's just suppose um, they go and they want to, or, or a U.S. citizen, before the U.S. citizen could go from place to place, but now with work restrictions and COVID and there's branches all over Europe, what would there, a U.S. citizen who is currently being asked to go to different locations within their company be expecting when they say, I'm in, supposed to go from Portugal to Paris, from Paris to outside to the U.K., outside the EU to the U.K.? What would, their, what would that look like for them? Uh, <clears throat> it would require a daily, a daily control of, you know, what, what's, what's, going, what's going on. Uh, um, uh, like in, I think in July or August, uh, the French, the French people couldn't couldn't go um, couldn't go to Spain without going through quarantine first. Uh, I think in the UK, um, um, travelers from from France have to go through quarantine, but it, and it hasn't been reciprocated in France. That is, the the, the British citizens can can I mean, uh, people from from the UK can can come to France without going through quarantine. Uh, so it's 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 very um, unbalanced and 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 and, and very moving uh, moving environment at, at the moment. Uh, and you know, as I said about you know with with uh, the example of those people flying from south of France to Norway, like in the afternoon it was just fine. By the time they landed, they had to go through two weeks uh, quarantine. Yeah. So that that's but but uh, but as of today um uh and um under the impulsion from the eu institutions there is a free movement of people between one schengen country to to the other mm -hmm. that's how it goes today how about within the uk i guess I was going to say it's the same thing, um, but with a little bit more warning, I think. Um, we, you wouldn't be mid-flight and the rules change. Um, we, we have a couple of days 
Um, and that's not much because we've had situations where someone's already traveled, of course, they're in the country um, and then they've been given a two day warning that the rules are going to change and they'll have to quarantine from that country. It happened with France, actually, speaking of France, we were, people were given 48 hours and either they quickly scrambled to change their flights or Eurostar tickets um, with the obvious spike in price um, or they thought, well, nothing I can do about this now. I just have to sit it out. So then they, when they arrived to the UK, they had to self-quarantine. Um, so we do get a, a couple of days notice. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not always helpful. Um, mm -hmm. so always check. That's the, that's the key. You know, uh, I would just, one of the panelists asked who pays for the uh, COVID test for those who require tests. I mean, obviously in the US, you know, they're just like, you didn't take the test, you're supposed to, bye bye <laughs> you don't enter. <laughs> they don't even, you know, you have to pay for it yourself. Um, I guess there is the hope that someone else is paying for it. I don't know, maybe other countries do pay for COVID testing. Yeah. Well, I mean, outside their own citizens. It's interesting because every country has different rules on this. So for example, in the UK, if you have a, a valid COVID test, which is negative, that does not mean that you, can't, you don't have to self-isolate. So even mm -hmm. if you got a certificate, you still need to self-isolate. So, so it's, it's interesting. But um, I know in Cyprus, for example, I did mention that already, it's 60 euros on arrival. Um, in Greece, um, they, they do it for free because they're making you do it on arrival. Um, so it, it depends. But in the UK, if you want to go privately, because for travel purposes, you can't use the NHS as a health service. Um, you can't use their precious tests, which are Far, you know, they're, they're, they're really limited at the moment for travel reasons. So you have to pay privately um, and they're anything from around 150 pounds per person. So it's expensive um, to get this done for travel purposes. I think there is um, so much to consider when people travel. There's just an immense amount of things to consider. The day hopping onto an airplane with like a tote bag is gone. <laughs> There's tests. Every country is different. I mean, God forbid what they're gonna do. And everything changes so rapidly. One minute they're there. And it's not unusual in the United States. You can't even enter a federal government building. For the protection of the federal workers, of course, same at the US embassies abroad, unless you quarantine for 14 days. How they enforce it, what they mean by that, depends, right? Depends. How about Okay. Um, sorry, sorry to I just remember another example. In Lebanon, they make you take a test before you get on the flight um, and you have to pay for that yourself. And then when you land, they make you take a test on landing as well. So you can see the, the, the huge variety. Every country is, is, is handling this so differently. And you're right about not being able to pick up your tote bag and go anymore. Even if you're an American citizen, you don't need mm -hmm. a visa, others do need almost every country now it requires you to submit an online form prior to boarding, which is kind of like a visa form. You know, where are you going? What are you doing? Where will you be staying? How long? So, you know, it has got far more complicated. You're right. Yeah. And what about in France, Stephen? Would you, would you say that uh, you would be experiencing um, COVID testing, anything like that upon landing? So um, if you if you test uh, if you carry out the test before boarding like ahead of ahead of the travel uh, you bear the cost but uh, um, if it's done if an arrival it's a free test um, however um, that question of, of costs is, is is interesting because a, a client of ours was telling us the other day that uh, if you fly uh, into Singapore uh, you get quarantined for I don't know how long one week or two weeks. But then it is not self-quarantine. The government imposes the hotel on you and you bear the cost. It's 2,000 euros. Wow. So, you know, it is something you, you know, you'd rather know before taking your flight and landing. Yeah, I mean, that would be quite a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> when, when companies are switching people over, they really have to say, who's picking up the cost? <laughs> I'll pick that hotel. But what do you think um, to, uh, to Marcella, uh, Maria, and Stefan, just, and, we'll, and if we haven't answered any of the questions, we can look at some of the Q&A. I try to get them in between all this, but um, what do you think um, the future that you can tell, I know that we're not fortune tellers, um, is going to look like in the UK in terms of their economy, their 
openness to the workforce, their immigration uh, restrictions opening or closing as um, all our countries are experiencing, um, you know, a challenging economy. Well, let me let me just uh, because there's a question here and I, I might as well uh, pick it up uh, and, and it's a U.S. I know you know why you know why because there's a question there and and I'm not, I don't want to get political here because they're asking if Biden gets elected um, so their positions are very different in terms of um, the economy so I, I I think and the reason we keep saying let's wait till November is um, the Trump administration has been able to restrict people entering to the U.S. but they haven't made changes substantive ones um, that we have yet to affect us in terms of people qualifying or what they're, how they're gonna change the H-1B requirements, um, what wages you have to have to be able to even get there or what categories are they gonna limit them? And if, it, if he gets reelected, then we might see other substantive, not just on entry changes, but domestic changes. And, and that's why we're, a lot of us are saying, let's see what happens in November. So that takes off one of the questions that you had in the Q&A. <laughs> So back to you, Maria. <laughs> Try to <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I, I was just going to say, which is, it's really interesting because we've got the whole COVID, travel, quarantine, all of that side of things. But from the immigration side, the pure immigration, um, things are back on track. Um, that, you know, the visa centers are open overseas. Uh, there's priority services again, so people, visas can be fast-tracked. Um, in relation to processing work visas, they're, they're being processed fairly quickly under the circumstances, almost back to where we were pre-lockdown. So um, that shows a clear willing from the government that they want to continue to, try, to drive business, to drive the economy um, and, and to help people move to do that. Um, so, so that's quite an interesting um, balance to, uh, to the COVID okay. issue. That's good. That's very interesting. Stefan? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the consequences that we may anticipate of the current situation for the future, um, um, I would say for, for the positive, um, I, would, I would point out um, um, maybe an urge for the deployment or an increased deployment of digitalization, like more, more, more digital filing and online, fi online filing for, for, application, for applications. Uh, uh, also an urge maybe now on the government to modernize the tools, um, identifying labor market shortages on a more real-time basis and update complete um, long outdated lists of professions exempt from labor market tests or standard work permits. On the, on the negative, however, um, uh, there might be more delays, uh, at least in the foreseeable future in terms of processing applications. Um, the, uh, ec that, like the, the real economic consequences of the current situation that are yet to be seen, we haven't seen them yet. I mean, at, at least as far as France is concerned, we, uh, the entire country has been under perfusion from the government and from the EU money. So uh, we haven't seen half of the bankruptcies and liquidations of companies and, and, and dismissal that are you know, probably going to happen within, within the, the, the month to come. So if the unemployment rate increases, then it's going to have a direct uh, impact on uh, future work permit applications that are subject to a labor market test. Um, uh, and we may also anticipate that in the future, um, the governments uh, will add to their list of documents to be, to be, to, 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 to be filed with the application and uh, documents regarding health uh, and personal information that, you know, wasn't asked before. Uh, but as a, as a, and that's my personal view as a, as both as a citizen and, and as a lawyer, um, what, I want to be very watchful of for the future is a full recovery of civil liberties. Because, you know, um, uh, um, by the reason of, of the threat um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the virus, uh, uh, through, um, uh, through fear, we've given up a lot. All of us and everyone and everyone and each of us. And, and I want to see the full recovery of civil liberties coming soon, immediately, if possible. Well put, well put. I cannot thank you enough. I, they're telling me I have to leave, so I don't know, but I cannot thank <laughs> the panelists enough. I could 
go on endlessly, of course. I hope I can take over anyway. And if anyone has any further questions, um, please go ahead and reach out. I thank you so much, Steph and Maria, for being part of this. You've really made this summit, which is going to continue to go um, all day so you guys can look at other things if you want to. You really, you really added so much to it and so much. We really, we really uh, appreciate mm -hmm. you here. And thank you very much, Patricia and Marcella. No, thank you. Our next one is nine weeks from now. And, you know, we're going to talk about U.S. and elections. And I'm sure we will be inviting you back for our next Coffee Talk. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.